Josiah's reign. A cleanseth through the land he doth ordain. Especially through repair or the temple. To purge the idols proved a task not gentle. But lo, it came about in thrice years twice. Completed he the plans that would suffice. And death he wrought upon the pagan priest. And scattered powdered bone on thine deceased. By 18 years into the dynasty. Into his chambers he hath summoned me. By all degrees I was the best around. Who writ with pen and ink on scrolls were found a history of deeds and all accounts that King Josiah did and spent amounts. Recording logs of all finances spent to Hilkiah, the high priest, I was sent. Delivered I the coin we did collect. Dispersed to the managers elect. So tiresome were we when the end was nigh. A secret council had Hilkiah and I. A book he laid into this young scribe's hands. And claim it its importance for the land. So take with me this book unto my Lord. And shake it off the dust from which was stored. <sighs> and read from the best parts of the word. The king was undeniably concerned. For such a wisdom he had never learned. For Israel and Judah, his heart broke and tore his clothes and wept and nearly choked. But soon he came about and gained his head to seek wise counsel what this book had said. Great things to come from this I do suspect. Back to our father's faith we shall connect. In truth, in love, in faithfulness, at best. What you just heard was a rendering of Second Chronicles chapter 34 in the form of a Canterbury tale in the perspective of the scribe of Josiah, Shaphan. And please turn there, Second Chronicles chapter 34, in your Bibles today. And while you turn, I have an announcement for you. Next Monday at 7 p.m., we'll have a parents meeting in room 106. If you are the parent of a teenager, please come out to hear all that's going on in the youth group and some important announcements concerning the current student ministries. So I encourage you to come on out, not tomorrow, but next Monday. All right, all parents of teenagers, next Monday, 7 o'clock p.m. All right, so the Canterbury Tales. They are a collection of stories written by Geoffrey Chaucer in the late 14th century. I remember this being my favorite part of English class when I was in high school. I was somewhat of a nerd. But I loved the Canterbury Tales, and they used to be taught regularly in school curriculum. However, according to the Consortium for Teaching on the Middle Ages, lesson plans that include the Canterbury Tales are disappearing from our school systems. This is due to a number of reasons, including lack of attention given to Chaucer by educators in selecting curriculum, and the lack of interest from students. But you see, the problem in America goes far beyond just the writings of Chaucer, but 
it extends into all of literature and in reality all of literacy. The problem goes way beyond Chaucer and according to the U.S. Department of Education, 14% of all adults cannot read. 21% can only read below a fifth grade level. And 19% of high school graduates can't read at all. And probably the worst part about these statistics is that these rates have not changed in the past 10 years. There's no question that education reform and literary reform needs to improve in America. But I pose to you today that illiteracy is just as much a problem in the secular arena as it is in the lives of American Christians concerning the Bible. Reform is needed in our lives as it was in King Josiah's day. And reformation comes with a serious study of God's word. Second Chronicles chapter 34 verses 14 through 21. When they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Hilkiah responded and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave that book to Shaphan. Then Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word to the king saying, Everything that was entrusted to your servants they are doing. They have also emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. Verse 19. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to to all that is written in this book. In Josiah's day, the book of the law was lost. God's word to his people had disappeared for some time. And illiteracy of God's word stretched across the nations of Israel and Judah. Out of 39 kings of Israel and Judah, Josiah is only is one out of only eight who was considered a good king. Out of 39 kings, only eight were good. Through the account of Josiah, I see two ways biblical illiteracy hinders our walk with the Lord and two ways biblical literacy improves our faith. Two ways biblical illiteracy hinders our walk with the Lord. Number one is that biblical illiteracy leads to a lack of conviction of sin. We read in the preceding chapters that the evil kings became heavily involved in idol worship. Two kings before Josiah, Manasseh, rebuilds all of the high places and sets up all of the torn down Asherah poles. He sets up altars for Baal. He places altars in the house of the Lord and he worshiped pagan gods alongside the God of Israel. He took a pluralistic approach to leadership opposed to what his father Hezekiah did. You see, his father Hezekiah tore down all those high places, all those Asherah poles, idols. But Manasseh, Rebuilt them all. Manasseh made his sons to pass through fire in witchcraft. 
and he also used divination. Manasseh seduced all of the people to do evil alongside with him. And they did worse evil in God's eyes than all of the surrounding nations that God had driven out before them in the past. He was such an evil king that the writer of First and Second Kings says that it is because of Manasseh that Israel went into captivity in Babylon. Now, you might be asking at this point, but Pastor Kevin, if the word of the Lord was lost, can we really blame Manasseh? If, if he didn't have the word of God to guide and direct his life, can we really blame him? The concern to give Manasseh the benefit of the doubt, though well-intentioned, is not very well-based. You see, throughout all of the evil kings' reigns, God was faithful to provide his prophets to speak up against the terrible actions of these evil kings. Countless times the prophets came to the kings and time and time again the kings neglected what the prophets would say. Without the word of the Lord, they lost the conviction of sin that the word of God brings. Without the word of the Lord, they ushered the prophets out of the kingdom and even fought against them. Have you ever had an I told you so? moment. When I was younger, I was learning about electricity in my, uh, or I'm sorry, about heat in my, uh, in my science class. And we learned that metal is a very good conductor of heat. If you put a metal spoon in a bowl or a cup of boiling water, the heat's gonna, the spoon's gonna draw the heat to it and the heat will go up the spoon and make the entire spoon hot. If you've ever cooked over a stove, you know that spoons, metal spoons, get extremely hot when left in hot water. So we learned about that, but we also learned that glass isn't too great of a conductor of heat. And when taken from cold to hot or hot to cold, it gets very weak and eventually the glass will shatter. So with this in mind, my teacher and I came to the conclusion that when pouring hot water into a glass coffee cup, it's best if you put the metal stirring spoon in the cup before you begin to pour the boiling water. Now me and my little brother, uh, my little brother, his name's Tim, uh, we loved making hot chocolate when we were younger. This is before my coffee drinking days. So what we would do is we would make coffee at every, or I'm sorry, make hot chocolate at every moment we had. Didn't matter the temperature of the day. It could be 97 degrees outside and we would still be making like goblets of hot chocolate. So we would make hot chocolate constantly. And one day I, I was my, my brother and I were making hot chocolate. I, I looked at him and I said, you know, Tim. I've been learning a couple of cool things in my science class. Did you know that if we pour this boiling hot water in these glass cups often enough, eventually they're going to shatter while we pour the hot, gla uh, the hot water into these cups? And he was like, no. And I said, yeah, it, eventually it's going to happen. I said, but how you prevent that is you put the metal stirring spoon in there first before you pour the hot water. And I was like so excited to share with my little brother this new bit of information I had. But my little brother just neglected my words of advice and my words of wisdom. And one day, uh, about two days after I warned him about the heat causing the glass to shatter, he went into the kitchen to make hot chocolate. And sure enough, a few moments after he went in there, I hear the sound of glass shattering and my brother screaming at the top of his lungs. So I rush in there to find my brother, jump back about 10 feet from the counter, and on the counter was a shattered coffee cup with hot water and bits of hot chocolate floating around on the counter. My brother had just washed this coffee cup, his favorite, 
and rinsed it in cold water before pouring the hot water into the cup. Luckily, he wasn't scared and wasn't burned, or he was just scared. He, he wasn't burned or cut. And I looked at my little brother, Tim, and I looked at him and I said, forgot to put the spoon in first, didn't you? Told you so. Helped him clean up and went on our way. But even though I had told my little brother the consequences of his actions, he didn't believe me. If I took my science book to him, if I had taken my science book to him and explained to him the processes and all the stuff that I was learning in detail and everything that these experts had, had said and described, chances are he would have taken that information a little bit more seriously. But since I didn't have my books to show him and he didn't see me as a reliable source, which for some reason all younger siblings always think they know better, he suffered the consequences. If he would have just listened to me, he would have never broken that glass. You know, that's how the prophets must have felt. They must have felt neglected, although they had an understanding of God's plans. Conviction fell void on the kings in Josiah's day. And today, conviction falls void on many Christians. George Gallup stated in a survey that Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. As a matter of fact, they revere the Bible so much that they choose to keep it in pristine, clean condition without even breaking it out of the wrapper. Only half of Americans can name one of the four Gospels. And fewer could identify Genesis as the Bible's first book. If we can barely name one of the four Gospels, how can we know what is contained within them? When we start to really study and, and read the Bible, we gain a new conviction from the Holy Spirit. Reading, studying, and memorizing scripture has a direct correlation to sin. Psalm 119 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Direct correlation, sin and study of God's word. We have to take this word, study it, Put it in our heart. Hide it in there so nothing can separate it from us. So that we, we can have a guide in our life. So many times we have Christians that walk around blindly in the dark. They hope that the light at the end of the tunnel, the, the light at the end of every week, the Sunday morning services is enough light to get them through Monday through Saturday. We have Christians that walk around blindly in the dark. The same chapter in Psalm says that God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I don't know about you, but you know, I, I get real tired real quick of stubbing my toe on a corner table or a stair in the dark on my way to the bathroom. When I was young, I used to, and parents would understand this, but when I was young, as a kid, I left my Legos and toys all over the place. And when I had to get up in the, more, in the middle of the night to go get a drink of water from the kitchen, I hated stepping on my Legos every time. But I never learned to pick them up for some reason. You see, we need to have a constant light and a lamp to guide our steps and illuminate our paths so we don't step on leftover Legos. With study and memorization of the Word of God, conviction moves on us when we deviate from His path and His plan for our lives. Reformation is needed. And it comes with serious study of God's Word. 
Now, not only does biblical illiteracy lead to the lack of conviction of sin, but biblical illiteracy causes a legalistic approach to Scripture. At the beginning of King Josiah's reign, in verse 3, we see that he began to tear down all of the idols that were in the kingdom. Josiah, for some reason, knew that he had to get rid of every other god that Judah was worshiping, but he really didn't have a basis for knowing why. It says that he followed after his father, King David. He looked towards his family line and saw that King David worshipped Yahweh only. So he decided, well, if I want to follow in that tradition, I've got to, got to tear down all these idols. And without really a cause or a basis for wondering why, he started to tear down all of the idols and get rid of all of the idols that were in the temple. See, he, he, he started to purge the pagan worship, but it wasn't until Josiah read the word of the Lord that he truly repented, tore his clothes, and sought what God was saying to the people through the prophets. He had a legalistic mindset of, I need to tear down these idols and serve God only. But he didn't know why until he read the word of the Lord and saw the plans that God had. In a dramatic turn of events, Josiah turns the entire land back to God. And the scripture says that there was none before him, nor were there any that came after him who turned to the Lord in such a dramatic fashion. See, there's an issue at hand with one hit wonder Sunday morning messages. Getting into the word once a week when the pastor preaches has the potential to cause a legalistic approach to scripture. It makes us to focus just on one portion of scripture, the one that the preacher's talking about. We lose sight that the Bible is one work with many books inspired by the Holy Spirit. We forget that there is a common thread throughout all of Scripture. We neglect how the New Testament relates to and completes the Old Testament. We miss out on seeing the love of Christ in the Old Testament and the long-suffering of a jealous and holy God in the New Testament. But when studied and learned as a whole work of God's word to humanity, we catch the joy of salvation history. That the mission of God is to seek and to save the lost. That from Genesis to Revelation, God has been working through broken vessels to bring his truth to a fallen world. And although evil abounds in the world, he has been faithful to protect and provide a remnant of his people that in such a time as this would rise up and fight for their faith. They would fight for reformation and evangelize the world. They were people who knew and were convinced that this book is not just a rule book of regulations, but the divinely inspired Word of God. They knew that God did not dictate the law as a means of, of condemnation and as, as a means of, of regulations and regulatory things that limit your freedom. But they understood that as Romans says, the book of Romans points out that the law was given not as a set of don't do this and don't do that rule books, but it was God speaking to humanity saying, this is what you already do. And it breaks my heart. And I want you to live a life full of righteousness, full of integrity. This is what you have done. This is what you are already doing. But that's not how my people should live. And it breaks my heart. So he gave the law to us to show us how to live in all righteousness. You see, they, they understood that God's heart was not to limit joy. 
but to expand your joy in all abundance. And when you begin to study the word of the Lord, you begin to see how great our God truly is. Faithful though we are faithless and mighty to save. Biblical illiteracy leads to a legalistic approach of picking and choosing of scriptures and leaves out the overarching principles of mercy, of justice, and of faithfulness. We run this risk when we neglect the reading and application of God's word in our everyday life. Reformation is needed, and reformation comes with a serious study of God's word. Two ways the biblical illiteracy hinders our walk with the Lord is that one, it leads to a lack of conviction of sin. Two, it causes a legalistic approach to scripture. And now very quickly, two ways biblical literacy or knowing what is contained in the Bible enhances our faith. The first is that biblical literacy helps us defend against false teachings. The Berean church was commended by the Apostle Paul because they searched these scriptures daily. If anyone came to them with a word, with a new message, Paul says that they went back and searched the word of God to find out if what they were being, what was being preached was true. I tell my students all the time, if you don't know what's in the Bible, how do you know that I'm not teaching you garbage? Sometimes I playfully threaten them that one day I'm just going to show up and teach them a bunch of nonsense and claim it's in the Bible to see what they do. You see, the Bereans are in stark difference to the church of Galatia. In Galatians, we read that they were being constantly led astray and accepting the preaching from every wind of varying doctrine that came their way. Paul even went as far to ask them the rhetorical, harsh, offensive question in chapter 3 of the book of Galatians. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? We need to search the Bible like the Bereans so that we'll be able to defend against the false teachings. Josiah was able, after hearing the word of the Lord and receiving counsel from a prophet, to continue to destroy all of the false gods and purge them from the land. All the false prophets and seers were killed. He tore down any idol and high place further than he had before in the past. And with the word of the Lord handy, he was able to defend against all of the false beliefs that have crept into their community. And we must be biblically literate and know what the Bible actually says so that we are not led astray by the latest trends of New Age spiritualism, pluralism, Mormonism, and more. Reformation needs to happen. And it will come with a serious study of God's Word. The second thing that biblical literacy does to improve our faith is simply this. It brings us closer in our relationship with God. When King Josiah read the word of the, God, word of the Lord, he made a restoration of the covenant with the people. He made a vow in front of the entire kingdom. He vowed that the relationship that he had with God would from that point on follow everything that God had commanded in his word. He rekindled the relationship with God and through his dedication to the covenant, the people heard and were convinced to also take this vow alongside with Josiah. Through the reading and understanding of the word, relationship was rekindled and rebuilt with God. How do you continue after this relationship is built with, rebuilt with God? How do you continue to build that relationship? Well, have you ever been in a moment where um, you're going to pray 
and you, wherever you're praying, it might be here at the altar, might be at home, uh, in a chair, at a, wherever you pray, at your desk, and you begin to pray, and man, you're like on fire. Like you just, you're just on fire praying uh, left and right. And you must be at the altar, in your chair, at the desk, praying, and it must be half hour, 45 minutes, and you're just, ah, uh, and then all of a sudden you look at your watch, and it's only been five minutes. So you're kind of like, okay. Uh, pray in spirit a little bit, hoping that God would give you something to pray about. You feel like you're all drained and you've prayed everything that you could possibly pray. When we read and apply God's word to our life, trust me, that will give you plenty to pray about. You see, when we study the Word of God, when we study and apply, the biblical literacy actually improves our prayer life. We read, we apply, and then we catch the vision and the plan of God. And then we are empowered to pray bold prayers. We are then able to pray those intercessory prayers that Pastor Glenn and Pastor Nick shared with us not too long ago. Biblical literacy brings us closer to God because we can find the many promises He gives us in His Word. I did a little bit of research on the promises of God. And though many have tried, there are way too many to number. One study said that there are approximately 7,000 promises of God that are contained in the Scriptures. Another study said that there are 5,000. Yet another said that there is an exact number of 3,573 promises in the Bible from God to man. Yet again, more studies say there are approximately 80 general categories of promises of God to man. I'm not going to go into exactly how many promises are contained in the scriptures. I'll leave that to you. But I want to challenge you to get into the Word of God and find some of these promises that He's given to you through His Word. After King Josiah renewed the covenant with God, he reinstituted the Passover feast. The Passover was intended to be a lasting ordinance with Israel. The festival was to remember how God sent a deliverer to Israel in their time of need. When they cried out to God to be saved and set free from slavery in Egypt, God sent them a deliverer, Moses. It served as a memorial of God's promise to lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. Josiah read of this promise, read of this festival, and then he reinstated it larger than any festival than the Passover festival had been since the time of the book of Judges. Josiah read this promise and when he read this, it deepened his relationship. When you hear and see and listen to the promises of God, your faith is built up and you grow closer in your relationship with Him. And through all of that, you become all the more thankful for what you have. We need to reform our thinking and our understanding of the Scriptures. And Reformation comes with a serious study of the Word of God. Two reasons that biblical illiteracy hinders our walk with God are that, one, it leads to a lack of conviction of sin, and two, it causes a legalistic approach to the scriptures. However, biblical literacy, reading and understanding what is in the Bible, helps us defend against false teachings and brings us closer in our relationship with God. Biblical illiteracy is a problem in American churches. 50% of all adults believe 
that God helps those who helps themselves is in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, wait, it's not? No, no, that is not in the Bible. Also, 50% of high school graduates think that Sodom and Gomorrah are a married couple. I fear that if the common trend of biblical illiteracy continues, all Christians, young and old, will leave the church in large groups when difficulties and challenges to their faith arise. Even worse, they might still come to church and consider themselves Christian, but live a life that is not exemplary of a believer in Jesus Christ, deviating from the Word of God. The type of person that Revelation says is neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, that God will spew from His mouth at the end of the age. The U.S. Department of Justice cites a direct link to illiteracy and delinquency, violence, and crime. 85% of all juveniles who enter the juvenile court system are functionally illiterate. And 70% of inmates in America's prisons can't read above a fourth grade reading level. Now, what does the U.S. Department of Justice and illiteracy and deviant behavior have to do with the church and biblical illiteracy? I pose to you today that the same trend flows into the church. If we don't become biblically literate and know what the Bible teaches, we run a high percent risk of falling into delinquency of the gospel. Reformation needs to happen. And it comes with a serious study of God's word going to leave you today with four ways that you can beat biblical illiteracy in your daily life. And worship team can come and help me out. Four ways to avoid biblical illiteracy. Number one, get a hard copy of the Bible. Very simple, very easy. Now I'm all for technology. I'm all for Bible apps. I actually have one on my phone, so don't shun me and say, Pastor Kevin hates technology. No, I have a Bible app on my phone. But I also have a printed copy of the Word of God. There's something different about the Word of God that's printed to where you can flip through it and, and you can highlight and underline and make notes in the margin and, and where you can go through and you can flip through and with your highlight you can see ways that God has spoken to you about that passage of Scripture in the past and revisit it and go back to it. The common trend with Bible apps is that people take their phone and their Bible app and they just look up the scripture that the preacher is talking about but they don't look up its importance to the book that it's written in or the entirety of scripture and they never go back to it that's the common trend of Bible apps number one get a hard copy Bible I even have friends who use different colored highlighters in their Bibles that cover different topics so when they're going through a rough time they will literally take their Bible and they'll flip through it and if they see the color of highlighter that they're looking for they'll go to that passage and they'll see the encouragement from God in the scripture dealing with that particular topic number one get a hard copy of the Bible number two memorize scripture verses this is a long lost discipline in the church. I had a professor at Bible college who suggested that we should have a class at Bible college based on nothing but the memorization of scripture verses. Use, uh, you can memorize scripture verses. There are plenty of study and memorization tools out there. Get flashcards and every day 
flash, use a flashcard and memorize a scripture verse. Keep it in your wallet, in your back pocket, and every free chance you get. If you're stopped at a red light, pull it out and just real quickly read over the scripture verse and where it's found to memorize that scripture verse. See, when we memorize scripture verses, we do the job of learning it up here to apply it in here. When we begin to memorize the word of God, we then put it into our hearts and hide it in our hearts and apply it to our daily lives. Then we are empowered to give a timely word of biblical advice to those who are in need. Why? Because we have it memorized and deep in our hearts. Number one, get a hard copy of the Bible. Number two, memorize scripture verses. Number three, study books or topics of the Bible. Take a few weeks and study one of the books of the Bible in depth. Go through the book of Romans. Go through the book of Acts. Go through one of the Gospels. Go through Corinthians. Go through books of the Old Testament. Go through the book of Judges, my favorite book to read. But spend a couple of weeks and dig into that book itself so you can see the importance of the individual books to the entirety of all of Scripture. Study books of the Bible and even topics in the Bible. Maybe you want to study certain hot topics that are pop culture today, like abortion, homosexuality, premarital sex. Find a topic that interests you and look it up. See what the Bible has to say about those hot topics. The media will tell you every reason why certain things are right or wrong. The media, the news feeds, the everything will tell you what is right and what is wrong according to the world's perspective. But why don't we take a moment and study what God's word says about those topics in society. Or if you want to do something less controversial, that's fine too. Do a, a study on certain topics such as relationships, money, sin, the Holy Spirit, the deity of Jesus Christ, and so on. Find a topic that interests you and study it in depth. Number one, get a hard copy of the Bible. Number two, memorize scripture verses. Number three, study books or topics in the Bible. And finally, number four, read books about the topics in the Bible and search their scriptural references. Go to Barnes & Noble and pick out a book dealing with a topic that you like that's in the Bible. Now, pick a book and don't just take what that book says is truth. Search the scripture references to find out if what the book is saying is true. Because I'll be honest, there are some wacko books out there that teach some funky stuff. But you take this topic and get a book that you're interested in that topic and read that book with your Bible right next to it. And search out the scripture references. We need to combat the epidemic of biblical illiteracy. And here today are four tools to overcome biblical illiteracy in your personal life. But why stop there? What about taking it to the next level and not just becoming biblically literate in your own life, but begin to promote the serious study of the Bible in your family? Study the scriptures at the dinner table after you've completed a meal together. Or maybe you don't meet together for dinner, but, but at the end of the day, you know, everyone's around. And maybe you turn on the TV and you all watch a certain show that you love. Take a moment. Turn that show off. You probably have TiVo or DVR recorded it anyways. But take that half hour, that 45 minutes... And as a family, study the Word of God. 
And when you begin to study the Word of God as a family, see what God does, the power of the Word of God. It is so powerful. When you begin to study the Scriptures and search through the Scriptures, see what miraculous things can happen. See that your prodigals are coming back home. See that your young children are being grounded and founded in the faith and their faith is strengthened. See them if you're concerned about their relationships with other teenagers. Get, start studying the Bible with them and see their relationships with other teenagers begin to be godly relationships. And see your marriage get strengthened. Watch as the Word of God brings you closer to your spouse. And watch as God heals damaged relationships in your marriage. We need to combat the epidemic of biblical illiteracy. And if you want today to take a commitment to combat biblical illiteracy, I ask that you stand with me today. If you want to combat biblical illiteracy in your life and in your family's life, I ask that you stand today. And let's sing a quick worship song to the Lord. Let's worship Him today as you make this commitment and seal that commitment in your heart as we sing Begin to pray that God would give you the boldness and the power to combat this epidemic in your life. You know, harvest time, the first step to understanding the Bible is knowing who the author of the Bible is. God loves and cares for the world so much that He purposed to have His Word and the path to salvation written down for everybody to see. The joy of Christianity is seen throughout the history of the Bible. And salvation history releases that joy in your life. To combat biblical illiteracy, the first and primary step is to know the one who wrote the Bible. Know the one who inspired the Bible so that we can read it. To know the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. If you wish to make that commitment today, if you wish to know the author and finisher of the faith, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment today. If I could have every head bowed and eye closed across this place. If you want to make that commitment, not just to become literate in the Bible, but to make a commitment to follow what is contained within the scriptures and receive salvation through Jesus Christ. If you want to make that commitment, I ask today you lift your hand as a sign to God of your commitment to Him. Thank you. Hands are going up all over the place. If you want to make a commitment to receive Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior for the first time today. Lift of the hand is a sign to God. One last moment. Hands are going up across this room. Hallelujah. To those who raise their hand, I'm going to lead in a prayer. I want you to repeat after me. And the rest of us, Harvest Time, is going to pray with you and celebrate with you. 
But I want you to know, those that raise their hands, that it's not the prayer that saves you. The Bible says that if you believe in your, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The prayer is the confession of faith. If you say this prayer in all sincerity with your whole heart, Scripture says that is what saves you. Let's pray and repeat after me. Father God, I thank you that the path to salvation is contained in the Scripture. I thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die. And that you raised him from the grave three days later for the salvation of the world. I thank you that I can read your word and see how you had your hand Working for this moment from the beginning of time. I thank you, Jesus, for coming and offering your life as a ransom for many. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior of my life. I submit to you, Jesus, and to the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, I want to encourage you, we have a free gift for you available up here. We're going to have some people up here that just want to talk with you and pray with you and put a free gift into your hand. And I want to encourage you, if you raise your hand and said that prayer for the first time, I want to encourage you to come on up. And you know, if you are embarrassed, grab a buddy that you came with and come on up together. Let's pray today as a family, as we make the commitment to combat illiteracy in our lives. Let's pray today. Father, we are so thankful for your word. So many times we forget how precious it really is. It seems so readily available to us today that we forget how wonderful your words truly are. I pray that all who are here today will take a stand against biblical illiteracy. I pray that we would begin to take seriously the study of your word. I stand here today, God, and I repent of times that I have not taken seriously the study and application of your word. And I pray that we would have a conviction and a strong desire to study what you say to us in your word to humanity. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that as we study and apply your word to our life and our family, that we would see the miraculous occur. That our prodigals will come home. That our children will be strengthened and secure. That our marriages will be restored. I pray that as we stand and combat the epidemic of biblical illiteracy in our lives, you empower us to take bold stands for your kingdom. Reveal to us the power of the word of God that is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword that cuts quick to the hearts of man. We commit to you now our hearts. We commit to you the reading and application of your word to our lives and to our families. We ask that you bless us as we take this commitment and apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name, and all of Harvest Time said, Amen, amen. and Amen.